What do I think coming uh, yeah. is coming? I think a whole incorporation of all those areas is coming. We're going to have wearables. We're going to have products that are going to be focused on what we, what we want to do. We're going to have personalized medicine in terms of some people need this product, other people need that product. So it's an exciting time. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Technology of Beauty, where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business. And today is no exception. Today, I get to interview Dr. Alan Widrow, who is my buddy, my friend, full disclosure, and who introduced me to trihex peptides. And he introduced me to nectar and life as I know it with Elastin, because I can tell you, there's not been a day in my life since I met him and started using Nectar that I didn't have Elastin on my face. And I know that sounds like hyperbole, but it's actually the fact. So finally, I was able to get Alan, Dr. Widrow, to come up here from Orange County, here to Manhattan Beach, home of uh, the Technology of Beauty Studios. Thank you, doctor. Absolute pleasure, and I, I agree, it's about time we had a little chat, so no kidding. good to be For here. For years I've been asking you to come <laughs> up. So finally you're here, so first of all, thank you very much. Absolute pleasure, good to be here, Grant. It's great to have you, buddy. I remember the day I met you. I remember uh, at a little booth, at a show, and you showed me the science, the histology of the fibroblasts and the extracellular matrix and the effects of the trihex peptide. And I remember my skeptical brain and yep. my disbelief. Right, right. And I think that's part of us as plastic surgeons. Yes. Uh, we are natural skeptics. And uh, I think that's probably what's influenced so much of the science that I've done in that we start off from an area of disbelief and then we've got to validate it and prove it. And that's sort of been the mantra right through this this whole process is, uh, and I remember that well as well, sitting you know in a booth, uh, Diane Goostry and myself, and you know Diane well, she's been on the program, the CEO of Elastin, and, and you know we walked lonely walks uh, in in 2015 along some of those booths with a scientific narrative because the narrative at that time was very different to what was out there. And, uh, and it, it was a lonely walk, and, um, but it was exciting as well because we we're introducing something new, a new and different science. And uh, although you were the skeptic, you were very accommodating in terms of listening to new science, which was great at the time. And I wanted to learn. So before we get to that, though, I want to go back and let everybody know, the listeners and the watchers and so forth. So where are you from? You have a beautiful accent. I know the answer to this. Share with us where you're from, where you went to school, and then how is it you got here? Right, so originally South African. Uh, I get a lot of uh, Australian or UK. There's a sort of mix in the South African accent. So I practiced as a plastic surgeon in South Africa for 20 years. Went to the university there, which is um, pretty, a well-known university in those uh, areas called the University of Advertisement, uh, and qualified there. Did general surgery first, plastic surgery afterwards, and uh, was involved in academics for a long time, and then moved over to private practice. Um, being uh, first, I did a lot of reconstructive and a mix of reconstructive and cosmetic, and then sort of went over to cosmetic surgery for the last 10 years or so of the practice. Um, but was always involved in research, always turned on by, by, by research and worked with some of the trade companies, uh, particularly in the wound healing space. It's been an area of great interest to me because wound healing is really the basis of all medicine. And um, so I became involved in companies like Smith & Nephew and helped them with some of the development of some of their uh, products then. And they really became quite entrenched in this whole wound healing space, started a whole lot of clinics myself, but didn't, I wasn't doing the day-to-day the -day stuff. I had wound healing experts doing that, but I was really interested in the science behind the products and the development of what we did there. Right. So that was a sort of pet side of, of, of mine on the, on the side besides the practice. And as you know, to have a practice and to do research, it's almost mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. exclusive really difficult. Uh, so from there, from that perspective, I sort of built myself up and I had the academic practice and I was a professor at the university and I became a, the president of the, of the society there, went through the, the same sort of things that, uh, that, that you've achieved and, uh, and accomplished, but on a smaller scale in South Africa. 
But then at the same time, the background of the insecurity and the situation there in terms of my kids growing up and the, and the insecurity of not knowing exactly what the future would hold was driving at me all the time in terms of looking for alternatives. Uh-huh. So having, having practiced and loved the specialty, uh, I'm, I managed to practice over 20 years, so it was an unfinished business. And then I made the decision. I did have a green card on an exceptional academic merit basis, which was very fortunate so the, the, you know the family could go over. But from that basis, I sort of decided, look, I've, I've, I've done my augments and my facelifts and my abdoplasties and, and all the rest of it. Uh, maybe it's time now to go back into the passion of research that I always wanted to do. And that's really what I did. So we came over at the beginning of 2010. And I uh, started off at the university, University of California, Irvine. Yep. Um, uh, worked with uh, Greg Evans, the chairman there, started lecturing, becoming familiar with the with the program and kept nagging him saying, you know, get me involved in some research. Here. And eventually in, in 2012 that happened, he said, listen, I've got something better for you than just getting involved. Won't you take over our, our research division? Uh, and that's what I did. So I started, we changed the name to the Center for Tissue Engineering, and we have a very successful lab running there with PhDs and with postgrads and undergrads and medical students and, and, and in biology students right across the spectrum. And I got to say, you know, the best way of, of, of learning, uh, the best way of, of learning is teaching. Yes, and, no and, question. And, and you're so familiar with that <laughs> and with, with your programs with fellows. You understand and, and appreciate the joy that goes into seeing these guys develop and how they, you know, become personalities in their own from being the sort of raw material. And then when they come out after a couple of years with you, that they, they become really good individuals and from from a medical standpoint, I love seeing that these are guys that are not only in clinical medicine, but they have a research background. So they know the questions to ask and that's the most important thing. Mm-hmm. So in, in a nutshell, that's, that's, that's really it. It was a m- amorphosis from uh, plastic surgery in South Africa to academics and to research and then to entrepreneurship, yeah. So. Okay, so, and you came over and you were at the University of California, Irvine or UCI. Correct down in Orange County, right. for those watching and listening, uh, working with Greg, the chair. And uh, you'd been there a couple years, you started the set, you changed the name, the Tissue Engineering, Center for Tissue Engineering. And then how did Elastin come into your life or how did you come into Elastin's life? How did how did that start? You know, and then take us to the trihex if right, you can. Right, right, that, that's, that's a great question because what happened was after so it was in 2015, roughly. I started in 2012. Right. Developed the and and there was a lot of work that went into developing the lab and starting it over and getting guys because don't forget a lot of the people working there are a volunteer basis and they're working there for a year, two years. Sometimes I even had guys for five years, and they would sub- supplement their salaries elsewhere. But they just wanted research experience and for the CV, you know, to look good and to also sort of actualize themselves in terms of research in areas that they hadn't done before. Uh-huh. So developing that was important and by the time it came around to 2015 I thought okay you know what we're going nicely now we've got a good platform for the lab let's see what is out there it's time to actually start exploring what is out there in terms of startup companies and other areas like that and I put the word out to my network that I developed over them a year or two unfortunately you weren't there yet Grant otherwise well, you would have been the first guy I would have emailed <laughs> but, I, but I put the word out there and I said listen guys it's terrific at the university I want to continue here I've got a good platform but if anybody knows of any co- company starting up out there you know I'm interested and uh, it, it would be uh, you know a good natural next step for me sure that was on a Sunday evening. By Monday at 12 o'clock, there were already a couple of responses to that, which is amazing and which is so beautiful about this country as well. Uh, and one of them was from a guy called Scott Glenn, who said he had uh, my details from John Garuda. Mm-hmm. John Garuda, I didn't mention to you that I developed <laughs> a, a scar product while I was in South Africa. And when I came out here, between 2010 and 2012, what I did was I spent a lot of time working on deciding who I was going to license that technology out to of the SCAR product. Um, eventually, I licensed it out to Skin Medica, part of Allegan now. And my product is still this, the, the SCAR Recovery Gel. But during that process, I met a lot of good people, one of which was, one of whom was was John Garudo, who's an excellent, as you know, formulator, superb. That's right. And, and works with I us at Elastin, he's my partner there. Yeah. 
And, and John had given my name over to Scott Glenn, who was the founder uh, at the time, or supposed founder of a new company, nothing had started yet. And we met in a coffee shop in San Clemente, sort of halfway, he was in, in, in Carlsbad and I was, I was here in Orange County. And we discussed over sort of coffee, he brought um, a, another PhD expert in, in a biochemist and he said, look, he has this one, maybe two peptides he's interested in, but he'd really like me to look at this and develop a white paper, give him sort of background of what it's all about. And at the time I, I said to him, look, you know, I, I'll do a white paper for you, but I'm really not interested in just doing a white paper. If there's, you don't know me, I don't know you, you don't have to promise me anything, but let's just see what the possibilities are. And about two weeks later, I called him uh, uh, and I said, you know, I've, I've done the white paper. I think that there are possibilities here, but I think that we need some tweaking and certain things we can add. And there's a common theme that we can use for this, actually. Uh, and he said, OK, email it to me. I said, no, no, no. He said, I said, do me a favor. Get all your guys together. I'll come down to Carl's bed and I'll talk to you about it. It's so much better than, you know, yeah, ha sure. having another messenger. And that's what I did, and that turned into a four-hour lecture. And I said to them, you know, and that's where we, we, we laid the groundwork for this extracellular matrix remodeling, all based on wound healing. And the trihex, which is the tripeptide 1 and the hexapeptide 12, said, you know, this would be excellent in terms, in terms of preparing the extracellular matrix, and I gave the background there. And, um, and by the time I was finished, you know, um, Scott said, okay, what do you want to join us? And uh, I thought I'd just start as a simple sort of one, you know, once a week, I'll, st I'll stop in, I'll see how they're doing and I'll advise them. And uh, that, that pretty soon changed. You know, in the first six weeks, I, I realized now. And that's 2015, and 2016 by that end time? End of 2015. Okay. So, uh, and more or less when Diane joined as well, and we became, you know, we formed a really nice partnership at that stage, and which has been, you know, steady ever since then. And um, they gave me, which I really appreciated, w when we started with the nectar, they sort of gave me a free reign in terms of the science after that and said, okay, this looks like it's an interesting narrative. The dermatologists and the plastic surgeons seem to enjoy that. And when, when uh, you know, my colleagues have a good news, sexy science story to tell, there's nothing that excites them more. So that was terrific. And this was a new kind of area that we were delving in and a new story. Uh, so that became really attractive, you know, for them. And, uh, and then we, we started, as you know, developing the products down the line based on the same sort of waste product, uh, prepping the skin, prepping before you did anything. And there's a lot of stories, you know, to that as, as well. So that's how it started. Well, I want you to take us through a few of them. Um, so we've touched on the, uh, in, uh, the trihex peptide, <clears throat> and it'll come up again, I know. But why don't you take us through, uh, say, Enhance? I mean, there's, you did, change that was a pivot if you will uh in terms of swelling and bruising and up until then you know we had arnica and a few other things topically and orally and so forth uh but why don't you take us through what you were thinking when you came up with enhance i think it's really right. quite remarkable so just to take you back a step um grant at the time there was a really big niche in procedure related uh topicals why was that because that's uh, for example, with skin resurfacing, if you did an ablation that was fairly deep, the skin was very vulnerable. Yes. And we were using very bland ointments at the time, petrolatums and things. And particularly, mm -hmm. it was bland because you didn't, when that skin was vulnerable, you don't want to, you didn't want to introduce an active that would had the possibility of an adverse event. Yes. So there were very few on the market that were successful. And I know that people said to me personally, you're crazy to get into that, that, that period of time <laughs> because their skin is so vulnerable and you don't want to take chances and you're going to have bad luck with adverse events. And I decided that, you know what, this is a really nice area to get into and we'd all discuss that. And uh, the other area was the preconditioning, is prepping the skin beforehand. And a lot of that was really based on wound healing because many, many years ago, when uh, growth factors, like platelet-derived growth factor came out and we thought we we're gonna use this for diabetic foot ulcers, we realized pretty soon that if you put it on without preparing that wound, you, it just disappeared within minutes because the wound over time and the products of metabolism had collected and you had enzymes and corrosive enzymes within this exudate that ate up whatever you put in there. So it was a waste of time. But if you prepped it beforehand, so you cleaned it, you uh, got rid of the inflammation, you put it under control, you uh, try to stimulate some epithelialization, and then you put your product on, your chances of success went up exponentially. 
So I looked at the skin and said, you know what, we've got a chronic wound. I'm not the first one to suggest that. But, you know, the skin, we've been exposed for years and years to the sunlight, to photo damage, to uh, wear and tear from, from, from normal sort of uh, day-to-day living. And that's a chronic wound. Mm-hmm. So what are the products of metabolism that collect there? We knew what they were in the chronic wounds, generally, if it was a diabetic wound, but what, are, what collects in the skin with time? And we started defining that and realized that collagen broke down, there were fragments, elastin broke down, there were fragments. We had a glycation in products from, from circulating blood sugar that also created a stickiness in the extracellular matrix. And we soon realized that within that dermis, which is the important part of the skin, we should have a constant dynamic conversation going on between the cells and the proteins, which are the collagen and the elastin. And that was not happening because it was getting clogged up by all those products of metabolism. So the first thing we looked at was trying to clear that. Let's clear that, and then let's stimulate a replacement for that with collagen and elastin, and Mm -hmm. we managed to do that with the nectar. And then at the same time with the nectar, because it was being used with um, ablation and there was a lot of inflammation, we added elements that were gonna decrease the amount of inflammation, et cetera. So you talked about enhance, but really the general theme there was get rid of waste products. Okay. So the first waste- That's the prep part. Exactly, that's the prep part, prep the extracellular matrix. And when that became successful and we saw, because we we first did gene expression and then we did biopsies and we made sure that everything was very well validated. And then when we saw, and it surprised us that in a matter of two to three weeks, we could see a change in that extracellular matrix. You were taking the old out, replacing Mm -hmm. it and replacing it with the new. So that whole concept for waste products was working really nicely. So we said, okay, we've developed this. The next step is maintenance, which we did as well. But then after that, if we're in devices and we're in that area of procedures, let's look at the other devices that create waste products. And the first most obvious one there was was cryolipolysis that was being done, non-surgical fat reduction, Mm -hmm. being done extremely commonly. What was the waste product? Well, we were actually intentionally injuring fat cells there. Mm -hmm. And they were going through a process that we call apoptosis. Programmed cell death took a long time. But when the fat cell died, it spat out this lipid droplets. And these lipid droplets were very pro-inflammatory. So the first thing we investigated is can we get rid of that waste, those waste products? in the form of lipid droplets, get the macrophages, which are the vacuum cleaner cells, to get that to stimulate clearance much quicker. And we found a way to do that, and we found a way to get it down, and we did delivery mechanisms. So to a long-winded answer to your question. No, no, really I th- I'm glad yeah. you're, you so you're right now at Transform, right? Right. So, yeah, so let's, stay, let's spend a few moments on Transform. I was going to okay. get to there. Uh, after Enhance, but as long as we're there at Transform, because I was a part of that study right. uh, also, right, and uh, I saw clear-cut differences of both when, before we started the real study on um, the admin, then when we started the study in the arms, it was so obvious the difference of the ones that were treated versus non-treated, yeah. and again, most people were very skeptical. Correct. Like Correct. They're saying, you what, you rub this cream on my arm and I get skinny? Yeah, and, and your cream that you're rubbing on the surface is going to get right down into mm-hmm. the fat area. Yeah, they- so, so we went through a whole number of steps, and that's why I'm mentioning Transform first, because yes. it was transformative, if you want, in terms of the science. Okay. Because basically what we did was, number one, Uh, we found a way to stimulate those macrophages to eat up the excess waste products a lot more efficiently. Number two, we found a way to to, to encircle it in a liposome. Now, the peptides are very nice and predictable. They're small molecular weight. They're 800 to 900 Daltons. You can get it through the skin pretty efficiently. But we wanted to get it through fast. When you did the procedure, we wanted this product to start working straight away. Okay. So we wanted to get down the hair follicle. Surrounded with a liposome, anything less than 350 nanometers, it goes right down the hair follicle. Okay. So we designed, designed a liposome. What's a liposome? It's a covering that you put over the peptide that can change its form, that can get into niches and, and, and crevices very easily. And if you make it 185 nanometers, it gets straight down the hair follicle into the base under the hair follicle. And immediately under the hair follicle is an area called dermal white adipose tissue, which is fat, and that sits on the subcutaneous tissue. So we had a shortcut. You put it down on the surface, goes straight down the hair follicle, gets into that dermal white adipose tissue, down to the subcutaneous tissue. 
So that's the second shift in terms of, okay, first we can, we can get the macrophages to work more efficiently, but how do we get it down? Right, now we've got a way to get it down there. So all of those became steps in terms of waste product management, in this case, the fat. So that was the stepping stone. We managed that. We did the clinical trials that you talked about. We did the non, you know, we did, a, we did in the upper arms. We did in the abdomen. Yep. We had a beautiful way of validating now with photographic equipment that could show you volume changes. So we were able to validate it really nicely. And we said, well, if you can do this with fat, can we do this with red blood cells? What happens with bruising? This has been a, prod- a, a problem that we've dealt with for so many years that the bruising and, and how do you speed it up and how do you make it less obvious? Well, this is the same story because your red blood cells escape out of the blood vessels into your, um, your extracellular space. Can we do something to um, speed up the process? So we found a way of speeding up the macrophages. We used the same sort of story. It's a concept called autophagy which is autophagy, auto the body doing phagy devouring. Mm -hmm. And the Nobel Prize was won in 2016 or 17 by a Japanese scientist that really described this. The body has a way of getting rid of these waste products. Uh, If the cell is not badly damaged, this autophagy process will help to actually let the cell survive. It will bring nutrients into the area. But if it's badly damaged, like we see with with, uh, cryolipolysis, basically it will repackage these big areas into smaller areas and stimulate the macrophages to come and get get rid of this. And we found a way with our peptides and our gene expression to stimulate that autophagic process. So we did that for fat, Now we're going into red blood cells. And with the red blood cells, we used an extra sort of component called lactoferrin, which is an iron absorber. So now we could actually absorb the iron, we could absorb the red blood cell particles. And then at the same time, we wanted to decrease the swelling. So so really without going into a huge amount of different science, the common theme here, which is new and different, is this waste product management and it's such an important part of it you know and with tongue in cheek when people say to me what are you you know what area you're in i say we're in waste management (laughs) (laughs) because when it comes to uh when it comes to skin health and comes to general health if you look at alzheimer's disease for example there's a there's beta amyloid that accumulates there are a whole lot of waste products that really cause and aggravate the disease and the same sort of story is true for skin so we've had this by using this kind of concept um, and, and partnering with different devices and different procedures, we found a way to actually get into a whole new area, get rid of those waste products a lot faster and everything really is optimized after that. So the enhance that you talked about, um, that's a product that we use with injections. Uh, yep. And so for bruising, for swelling, that's really good. It gets the, uh, it makes the bruises disappear really quickly. And by the way, to validate bruising is a whole nother concept because if you look at the literature, short of dropping weights on somebody or shooting them with a paint gun, there's, there's very little that you can use as a model. So we had to develop our own models for that. We had to develop in vitro models. Um, and, um, and so that all became a common theme. And I'm happy to say with all the clinical trials that we did, and now it's been on the market, all these products for, for quite a while, uh, that's been a really major breakthrough. And then the next area, as a plastic surgeon for me and for you, I mean, in terms of thought, well, you know, if this is working for non-surgical fat reduction, what about invasive surgery? Because we're also, we, with our liposuction and with our dissections and our abdominoplasties, we really are interfering with the fat area and yep. we're releasing a whole lot of lipid droplets. And when I started looking at the science of the lipid droplets, it appeared to me that the lipid droplets being so inflammatory were causing a lot of the induration and the swelling and the edema that we were seeing post-surgery. And a lot of the patients, you know, complain of fibrous banding, in other words, discomfort for a while until they can get mobility. And that's Mm -hmm. really internal scarring that changes, but can we speed that up? And, um, and so that was the latest one, and you were involved in the trials as well, is in terms of invasive surgery, let's pre- precondition these patients beforehand. Mm-hmm. Let's apply this reform and repair, which is the new product. But I combined what we had learned from the body product. I combined, it, combined what we learned from Enhance, so bruising, swelling, um, getting rid of the fat droplets earlier, and then the nectar in terms of preconditioning. So putting that all together, plus adding a component for scar control and making that into one product 
became a very, very natural, logical next step. And that's where we are, and I'm really excited about this because reform and repair, before major surgery, as you know, invasive surgery, you start two or three weeks before, prep it in the, in the area that we're gonna be operating on. Immediately afterwards, same story, put it there, you can put it directly on the scar, mm -hmm. and it covers that entire area, and we've just finished this, this sort of multi-center uh, trial, which was really exciting because the biggest uh, advantage was that fibrous banding, and that was the area that I was most keen on trying to reduce. In other words, 46 weeks down the line, these patients are so much more comfortable because that scar tissue inside dissipates really quickly. That's fantastic. So <clears throat> you've obviously come up with a lot of different uh, solutions and your efforts to uh, be the garbage truck sort of a, exactly. to clean up all this. Um, and you know, lately we've been seeing a lot more of this regenerative medicine everywhere we look. Yeah. Uh, at the different meetings, it's exosome this, exosome that. Can you tell me about your thoughts about exosomes both today and also in the future? What role you think they may be playing Absolutely. in skin care? and uh, restorative health. And yeah, so you know, exosomes, it's, it's a very interesting concept and it's very exciting when they discovered it. And these are small particles that the <coughs> cell gives out. It's a sort of communication, a way of communicating cell to cell. Okay. And they're different sort of sizes of these little particles, but what they've discovered is that the particles called exosomes uh, contain miRNAs, lipids and proteins and those are sort of instruction molecules telling the next cell what the status of the previous cell was, what we need to do, what, what's needed here. What. So the signaling mechanism is really elaborate in this tiniest, tiniest of, of, of particles. So if you can get to that and you can understand the conversation and then you can actually include parts where you can control that conversation, then you're gonna change the whole network of cells and the way cells behave, which is so exciting. The problem is that at the moment now, the exosomes contain so many different particles that actually controlling that conversation is really difficult. And one of the areas that I've tried to veer away from is using for our skin management is using growth factors, biologic stem cells, exosomes, because there's a whole area of unknown about them, that there's certain things that we know, but there's certain things that we don't know. Um, you need to be able to get from each batch that you produce consistency, which is very difficult when you're looking at biologics. You need to have predictable behavior from them, which is really difficult. Uh, so from that perspective, pro, uh, peptides were really attractive to us. Synthetic, we knew what we were getting, we, we, could, we could measure the, ex the gene expressions and everything, and we, we, you know, it was very predictable. So take that same concept with exosomes. What excites me about that, and nobody, there's one scientist that I know at the moment that is doing this, for me the most exciting part, is seeing if we can define the indication that we want for that exosome, and then take that miRNA and the protein and the lipid that was part of that exosome and create it synthetically create a synthetic exosome. And I can see that that's a new sort of concept, a new concept to most people, but there is one scientist from the Max Planck Institute that I spoke to that has sort of started doing this. And for me, mm. that's the exciting part. Why? Because then you hone down on exactly the indication that you want. Mm -hmm. You've got your standardization. You've got it off the shelf now. Uh, the other thing about exosomes, which is interesting, is it doesn't have the same sort of immune reaction, so you can use exosomes off, or off the shelf. But if you use a synthetic one, you cut out all the background noise that we don't really understand, and you stop all the potential for this being tumorigenic and all the things that we're scared about in terms of exosomes, and you hone down just on the indications you want. So what excites me now is we're sort of at a perfect storm where you have molecular biology, genetics, biomedical engineering, a whole lot of wearables, the technology for validation, all of these have just gone up you know, exponentially. And for me to be able to create those biologics like exosomes, stem cells will look at the secretomes, in other words, what is secreted by the stem cell rather than using the, st the cell themselves. And if we can produce those synthetically, mm -hmm. that for me is where the future lies with this. That's very interesting. So is it true that if I were to take my platelets and uh, someone were to get my exosome, yeah. that my exosomes could be injected into you? 
or that put it coffee, could without be, having an immun- yeah, you immunologic know, you, reaction? Right, right. And you mentioned platelets because that's also quite an interesting one. And, and, and for me, that's even more interesting than the others now because we're honing down on an area now. So regulatory-wise, it's a little safer here because we know platelets have got a restricted sort of action compared to stem cell exosomes, for example, where, we, where there could be a host of different reactions that we don't understand. Platelets are a little bit more predictable. Um, but the thing about the exosome is they don't carry the same kind of antigenic signals. In other words, the sort of rejection that you would get from normal cells that would use transplanting from one person to the next mm-hmm. is not in the exosome. So it's sort of immune privilege from that perspective, mm-hmm. which makes it attractive as well. Uh, the danger, again, for me, or the unknown, is we think we understand some of it, but there's no question we don't understand a lot of it. So what's it going to do, you know, that right. we're not anticipating uh, during that? And that, that's why I love this sort of way of let, let's see if we can restrict it in terms of where we want to go. In terms of their size yeah, or their valency or whatever, the, uh, do they have any problems getting through the skin? No, not really. Uh, w- look, um, the size is tiny, but you, what you'd have to do is, some t- depending on the formulation that you're using, uh, and this goes with everything, is you need a balanced formulation. pH is sometimes important. Li- liposomes are sometimes important, especially to actually protect it. So liposomes are important in terms of actually delivery mechanisms, uh-huh. but they're also important if there's any instability or a problem with the degradation of a live biologic, then you would actually encircle it and encapsulate it to protect it and to get it in there. So there may be little nuances that you need to protect it and to get it in there as well. Okay, yeah, but I'm seeing more and more companies uh, pop up with a transcutaneous or a lotion yeah. type of uh, exosome delivery. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I, I understand there, and it's exciting science, but I think that it's we're not at the phase that we understand it fully yet, and that concerns me a little bit in terms of you know w- what we're seeing. Also, don't forget with biologics, in order to keep them um, not as much with the exosomes, but with cells and growth factors and all that, to keep them stable and alive you need preservatives a lot of preservatives you don't need that with synthetics with peptides etc okay. and preservatives are not that friendly to cells generally so we want to try and stick away from that as much as we can could an exosome be uh dehydrated and then reconstituted subsequently um, is a non-synthetic exosome yeah yeah to an extent again all of those uh you know, in fact, and even in isolating the exosome, right in the beginning, we had to use ultracentrifuges. Nobody, very few people had the ultracentrifuges. Now there are other ways of doing it. So it's a little bit like battery technology, is it was so difficult to start with and there were so many problems oh. until the interest level reached a certain crescendo and then all sorts of things came out. And the same is happening with exosomes now. Different ways of isolated, different ways of using it. So it will be part of our vocab and and. and be used in the future, but I think there are the tweakings that need to happen first. Okay, well, I, I'm sure you'll be right there at the forefront, and I'll be watching you very closely. Now, let's move over to Galderma. Yes. And Galderma purchasing Elastin, and then recently I heard that you are not only just staying with Elastin, but you're also taking another more extensive position with Galderma. Could you share any of that with us? So, um, that has not been announced quite yet, but uh, <laughs> let me just say that we are um, we're thrilled to be part of Galderma. If there ever was a partner that we could sort of hone down, and, and I'm sure you know, you, you've know you chatted to Fleming a number of times, and every second word of Fleming's is innovation or science, and mm-hmm. that goes right down my alley. So, so we really got on very well. Because they're within big companies, there's organic and there's inorganic growth. And most of the companies today are focused on inorganic. Inorganic being acquisitions, let's acquire this technology. We won't do too much of the R&D in-house, but we'll acquire that because we'll get to the market a lot quicker. It's a lot more expensive, but we can get to the market a lot quicker. But to be called an innovative company, you need to have both. And my sort of area of expertise and what I love doing is organic growth. In other words, in-house R&D is let's disrupt, let's try this, let's do a moonshot, let's do something different in terms of looking at new technologies and new science and see where we can go with that. 
and Galderma has just increased the palette that I have in the in, 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 in the canvas, if you will, for me to really get knee deep in it. And they've also been extremely encouraging. So Elastin, we're going to continue. We've got exciting things coming up. But it also gives me a good opportunity with Galderma to look at not only aesthetics, but to look at some of the, the uh, prescriptions, to look at some of the cons consumer. You know, not everybody can afford the premium products that we're talking about today here. Um, and if we, it, you know, are there alternatives? Can we tweak some of the consumer products that are selling for 10 or 20 bucks, add some, a little bit of science there that will actually make a difference and indications that will be really good for that. So if the patient can't afford the premium product, mm -hmm. we now have another alternative for them to go into one of the uh, stores and purchase this you know, at, a, at a much reduced price. Will you be staying <coughs> at UCI? You know, I, it, it's been incredible because Elastin encouraged me to stay. I was always concerned about that. And Galderma again have encouraged me to stay because I think they understand that for me, to again the the best thing about learning uh, is teaching mm -hmm. uh, to be to have my ear on the ground there uh, and to be part of whatever is going on you know we're doing so many really great projects we're doing um, ear cartilage uh, framework tissue engineering <coughs> we're doing <coughs> excuse me we're doing stem cell research based on fat grafting we're doing um, areas like Dupuytren's disease that you understand, uh, where we're looking at fibrosis and, and, and um, converting fibrous tissue into fatty tissue. So there's so many beautiful areas that sort of cross fertilize the way you start thinking that direction, you can automatically use that in other areas as well. So, sure. so I want to keep up there. Galderma have uh, encouraged me to continue with that. So yeah, I will be continuing with this. I hope you do. That's great to hear that they're not going to make you move to Dallas or no, no, no. something terrible not like happen. that. We're Southern no, California. Nothing against Dallas. Yeah, but no, I know exactly. how happy you are to be in the OC. Exactly. And I'd hate to to see you uprooted. So you've been through a lot actually in a relatively short period of time. Yeah. When you really look at this, I mean, you were a plastic surgeon, you still are. Yeah. Uh, you're a professor, an academician, then bench research, clinical research, and you came over to the States. And you've seen an awful lot, Alan. It's pretty amazing to me in a relatively short period of time. No, if you look at the big right. picture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I can think, I remember back in 15 and 16, actually. So I'd like you to look into your crystal ball and tell us all what you see over the next one, three, five years. It's very exciting, obviously. You're right at the forefront of all this. So I'm sure you're limited in all the different secrets you can and can't tell us. But within the scope of what you can tell us, what, what do you see in the future? You know, it's interesting, and, and you talked about this. I, I've created a beautiful hybrid for myself, which I could never have designed had I not been part of it. In other words, you have to be here, and you have to be evolving to be able to do this. And for me to have the academic side, the research side, the uh, working with companies that are turned on by science, is just a beautiful sort of area. And to match that, the perfect storm that I described earlier on in terms of genomics and gene and molecular biology and and bioengineering, and I work a lot with bioengineers. Okay. Uh, and um, engineers, just in terms of the wearables and the technologies. So I've hinted at that, and I think that the next thing is that, that's gonna come is, if you look at molecular biology, there's your synthetic exosome I was talking about. Uh -huh. If you look at engineering, you've got wearables now where they can use polyurethane film, which is like glad wrap with sensors in, you can put it on here, and it can tell you all sorts of things. So we'll walk outside there, and they're gonna say, listen, your skin's dry, moist, you need to apply this too much sun, do this, et cetera, et cetera. You'll have a personalized way of actually working out exactly what is needed on, on the skin side. Uh, gene expression with gene sequencing, and now we have single cell gene sequencing that tells us a huge amount about the individual cell, which is different because with, uh, with uh, genes and, and gene therapy before, we had to put a whole lot of cells in there, and then work out with all these cells, what is it doing? Now you can take an individual cell and see what the signaling is there. So single cell sequencing, huge story as well. CRISPR in terms of changing genes, uh, you know, and altering the genes and looking at, at, at disease processes and being able to alter the DNA. And then 
putting that all together and being able to get consumers to actually have products that are sold over the counter that they can get really quickly with science that is related to all those areas that I talked about makes for a very exciting future in terms of that. What do I think coming yeah. uh, is coming? I think a whole incorporation of all those areas is coming. We're going to have wearables. We're going to have products that are going to be focused on what we, what we want to do. We're going to have personalized medicine in terms of some people need this product, other people need that product. So it's an exciting time. I'll say that's very exciting in the field of aesthetics, but also medicine in general. Correct. Um, well, it has been very uh, exciting to talk to you once again and see a little bit into the future. It's certainly been a great ride for me personally, getting to know you and seeing that science can actually drive a skincare company. Likewise, and uh, not just marketing, but real science I and metrics. It. And I want to compliment you what you and Diane and the entire Lasten team. Uh, have done in five, six years is truly remarkable, and you've changed the entire landscape. I appreciate that, uh, and, and really it's always fun to be able to interact with you. You've always been so enthusiastic about the science, so it's always a pleasure for me to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much, you. Alan, and thank you for coming up here. And I'd like to thank all of you also for joining us on this episode of The Technology of Beauty, where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business. And as you heard today, was no exception. Thank you, Dr. Widrow. Thank you, Carl. See Good you, see buddy. You.